modern world is this connect digital connectivity. Okay. So I'm going to make that case today. A little introduction. I am the director of research of the Utah Community Research Group at the University of Utah. Like I said, I'm an economist. I teach microeconomics. I teach statistics, applied research and data. And I also teach American economic development and history, which focuses specifically on technology and social institutions and their connection to American development. And so again, I'm coming back to this idea that as I started to really think about broadband's role in the economy, it is one of the most critical. And as I dug into GDP numbers, as I'll show you, the, the math is there to support that. I'm also the founder and CEO of Imperitas. We're an economic artificial intelligence company. We're a spin off from the U, located in Holiday. We use data and research to find profitable groups through the noise. All right, I'm going to be pretty sloppy. I have a couple friends who are IT people, which is their own breed of people. And they, they were pretty critical when I first started running some of these ideas by them that I was too sloppy in making the distinction between connectivity, broadband, internet, and those terms. I'm going to be using them pretty much synonymously. I'm going to be using internet most of all, but I understand there are differences in some of this. I'm talking about, and I will focus on, that ability to digitally move data back and forth. All right. So my argument today has four parts. The first is I'm going to just very quickly go over some of the background of how we got to this point, the 2015, not this summit in specifically, but the technology level at 2015 of this digital connectivity and the impact that that's had on the world specifically because it's connecting people, which then people can share ideas. And I'm going to actually show a couple other technologies that have had similar but much smaller scale effects like this in the world, where they allowed people to connect, and as people moved, ideas came with them. But when you start to allow ideas to move without people having to move, things really take off. And we're only seeing the beginning of that. And that's my third point, that Right now, where we're at a global demand, everybody's out there screaming big data. It's nothing compared to what's actually about to be coming through all these pipelines. And this is a term that some people have, not just myself, coined as the data apocalypse. This is the second wave, sort of like if you've surfed, you get hit by one wave that you think's bad. It's the second one that's even bigger. And the Internet of Things is, is what's being most associated right now with that second wave that's going to come, but it is massive compared to what's happening now. By the way, I, I'm an academic, I guess, at my core, a big part of me. I teach uh, two classes a semester. I would rather run this like a classroom than what it is right now, where nobody's going to you know, jump in. If you hear something that you don't agree with me right now, I'm going to say some pretty out what I think are outlandish things. If you don't agree, jump in right then. We don't have to wait for a Q&A to the end. If there's something that you think is gold, feel free to throw money to show your praise. But four parts, OK? We're going to go through first how we got here. I'm not going to go trace the whole origin of computer coding to uh, fabric factories in Lowell, Massachusetts. If we were going to go all the way back, we would have to do that. I'm going to specifically start 1956. It's a very pivotal year. Two major things happen. There's a transatlantic cable that's laid. It can only handle 36 simultaneous communications at one time. That proves to people, because this had been tried 70 years before. In the late 1800s, they had actually sent a cable. But this infrastructure, as some of you may know, very hard to maintain. When there is reliable communication, not just across the Atlantic, this is an expression of a general increase in the technological level of sharing information. That is happening at the same time as computing. And so the first, IBM's first hard drive based computer, five megabytes, a nice SaaS subscription model of $30,000 a month today. You have five megabytes. Collectively in this room, there's got to be a couple terabytes of data on us right now. 
take that, multiply it up, and imagine what the, it's an infinite cost. It couldn't even actually exist. Those two technological pieces come together. It's not long before, and it was always the military that was leading at this point in time. What will eventually go on to become DARPA says, well, why don't we have this instant communication net? This was originally called the Intergalactic Computer Network. But its vision was that it was someplace that it was going to be a common that was open to everyone. And look at this order that is presented, because this also tells you who was paying the bills at the time. Government, institutions, corporations, and individuals. Who currently uses the most of this infrastructure today? This is like their, this is their planning meeting. Who's going to use this early on? And they're saying governments are going to use this. Institutions, meaning academia. And that's who their partner was on this. And then behind academia would be corporations, and behind them would be consumers. And that's what this tool of communication is going to get built to be. And it turned into the internet. And who is now the biggest user of it? Yeah, the individual, the consumer, the one that was at the end of the priority list at its inception, ended up becoming its most important user and has driven all of what's actually started to happen. And that's because whether it's government, whether it's an academic institution, whether it's a business, all of those things are just aggregations of individuals. What this technology really allowed and the promise it fulfilled is connecting individuals to other individuals. It's a distributed network. It's not a single thing. And this is what has allowed all of the modern connectivity that we have. Like I said, there have been past technologies that had this similar effect. Okay, steamboats, rail, uh, interstate, jets, all those things allow, again, a physical person to move from one place to another. And to do it extremely fast relative to the other next best alternative, economists always think about opportunity cost. And in, in folk terms, that's next best alternative. The next best alternative to all of these things is to walk. All of these significantly increase the speed with which people can move. And as people move faster, ideas move faster, economic uh, opportunity explodes. The canals are a really early example of this. They drive patents. They drive economic boom. They move production out of the household and into standardized processes. So there's other technologies that have had these kind of effects. And again, the thing that's common between those and the modern equivalent, which allowed people to move, with, or ideas to move without people, which are digital, the telegraph, the telephone, radio, television, none of those have had the same kind of impact as that actual individual level connectivity that the internet has provided. So in 1995, less than 1% of the world was connected. Who can vividly remember 1995? Yeah, it doesn't feel, even to me, I was 15, it doesn't feel that long ago. Only 1% of the world, everybody was on AOL too. That's the whole 1%. But the most recent So there's an explosion again in computing power. Things get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. More people have the vision, Bill Gates' vision of the PC starts to actually be realized. It was only the techies that were into the internet in 1995, but that's true of all these technologies. Radio was seen as way too techy early on. People fear some of these initial technologies but once they demonstrate that they're actually going to be of value, then they're rapidly adapted. Internet has been adapted much faster than any of these other technologies that preceded it. And like I said, in the economic data, this is pretty clear. 20% of GDP growth. So do you understand what GDP is? Everything that we produce in a single year within the territorial bounds of the United States, including the Virgin Islands probably. I don't know, I have to check that. Anything that's American produced, goods or services. 
do you know what our GDP is at right now? I think it was 17 trillion last time I looked, which is so much higher than any other civilization has ever accomplished to this point that we have record of. It's a massive, massive system, 300 million people. 20% of that growth going on right now is directly attributable to this internet infrastructure and technology. Because just like the rail, just like the steam engines and the steamboats, it allows people to connect faster, instantaneously now. And they can connect from ever more parts of the world. As people connect, the ideas get shared, and this is where that growth because this is new GDP. This is not what we were doing last year. This is all the stuff that we've added this year. 20% of what we're adding this year is attributable to the internet. It's also why if you start to look at the companies in the United States with the highest valuation, a whole bunch of them are new tech companies relative to people that have been on that list, in some cases for 100 plus years. So it's an amazing technology. And we're entering a whole new era, the zettabyte era, so a billion gigabytes of information exchanged every month. And that's just information exchange. It's not even storage. So why is this important? Well, like I said, I came at this as an economist. I looked at all the places that I felt like the internet had a direct impact on GDP and some other stuff. Where are people actually using this in their life? How is it actually impacting beyond the choice of just what to, to sign on and to do? How are people actually using it and in what ways? And these were the six positive things. I'm only talking about the positive. I know that each of these includes a negative use. But overall, the economy is bigger this year than it was the year before. Life is better seemingly this year than it was before, unless you count some health metrics. The world does seem to be improving. What is driving it? Being able to attribute a fifth of that to just one thing is pretty important. So what are those? How does it then translate into the actual economic gains? The first is it is a time machine in the same way that all those other devices that I just talked about were time machines. You could now travel across the United States by plane in hours when it used to take you months and you might have to eat another person. It was not an ideal way to travel. And yet when the train comes up, people don't immediately go to the train. There's people out pamphleting, because that's what you did before you had Twitter. And they were pamphleting that the rail was posing a danger to people's health because they didn't know what would happen when your body went more than 20 miles per hour. The working theory was all your organs would dissolve against your inner back. Yeah. People fear these technologies. As soon as they demonstrate their quality, they're rapidly adapted. They save em enormous amounts of time. The internet doesn't have a high barrier to entry. There isn't a lot of risk. And so because of that, the, ad the adoption has been much faster. This has drastically affected the way people are working. Our company in particular, we have people that work on our team that are on the other side of the country. We sometimes work on things that are touching global countries. It's only possible because we have all of this digital connectivity. And so it's a great time machine, especially around work. And as far as productivity goes, I know the American worker, do you know that the American worker wastes 25% of their day? 25% of their day is spent doing not their work. 1% is looking for a new job. There's this huge waste, and people blame it on the internet. It's not because of the internet. The internet has allowed more productivity than has ever even been possible. Again, it shows up in that GDP data. So it's been a great productivity multiplier. It's a teleportation device, and right now that means you can see and hear things somewhere else in the world. Facebook with their Oculus. Some of the other HoloLens with Microsoft, they're trying now to put into place something where you'd actually be able to maybe, maybe even experience something somewhere else in the world from where you are. You no longer have to travel geographically to actually experience these things. And that's not just 
in current time. People have been going back to Google Street View because they've been taking years of data and they've been watching whole neighborhoods change in real time, near real time. There's a, a CAD program online that will let you walk through ancient ruins. So if you're a big Greco-Roman fan, you can walk through the Roman Forum. And right now, you just have to sit there on a computer and look at it, but when this technology changes where you can actually wear something, you'll actually be able to truly experience something that's not even tied to your own time period. One of the, if maybe not the most important things that the internet has provided is this centralization concentration of all of human knowledge. The last time the, the Western world, not the world, but the Western world, had this kind of concentration of knowledge, it was in the, Alexand the Library of Alexandria. And when it was burned and destroyed, there was a huge loss for the world, as far as knowledge goes. Well, it's, now it's on something that's distributed that even if one server goes down, it doesn't matter. It doesn't ruin that knowledge. It doesn't get destroyed. And that knowledge can be shared very quickly, which means ideas can be vetted. Uh, anybody ever see the story of Fold It? So f there were a bunch of these academics that got really frustrated that they couldn't figure out how this enzyme should fold. Theoretically, they couldn't work it out. And I think they'd been on it for a couple years before someone said, why don't you gamify this problem and turn it over to the public? Within three weeks, some armchair person at home had solved it. That's, again, that power is provided by the fact that those people can connect without ever physically having to even meet. <clears throat> this technology offers the ability to then rapidly change things. We've seen this with governments. Everywhere Twitter goes, a revolution seems to follow. As people connect and they realize they might not be the kind of minority that they thought they were, and they can unify, we've seen this spill out politically. We've seen that same unification just take on established business. Disruption is everywhere right now, and it's always a 19-year-old kid in a t-shirt that's behind it. <clears throat> but it also allows people to share experiences, and there's, this was said of the radio. This was said of television, that one of the things that helped form an American identity in the 20th century is that everybody was suddenly experiencing the same thing. And when it was radio and television, it was at the actual same time. It wasn't Netflix or on demand. Everybody was experiencing the same thing at the same time, and that had really important bonding effects as far as social cohesion. This technology allows that to happen, but it happens at the individual level and not necessarily from some government broadcast. Outside of GDP, and GDP does not directly measure anything like happiness, outside of GDP, there's a very important place where the internet has provided value in people's lives. This is why I believe so much of GDP growth is, is being experienced in this portion of the economy. It's that people are happy. This technology allows people to do terrible things. It also allows people to do great things. And there's way more people doing great things than there are people doing horrible things. And so overall, it is adding to the general joy level of society. This is why something like Gungam Style can get 2 billion hits, break YouTube, and drive the stock of a Korean company. If you haven't looked up that story, that again, go back to predictable human behavior. There was so much joy in that video that it actually ended up translating into profitability for an organization that had nothing to do with YouTube or the video. People really like being able to share photos. People really like being able to video cast when they talk instead of talking over the phone. It has added real value, and this, is, this gets to an important point, which is why what is about to come is going to be so huge. Because the thing, again, go back to the beginnings of the internet. It was about governments and academics, then maybe business, and then consumers. And yet it is now whatever the consumer wants that drives the whole development, and then it just spills into this entire system. 
And it's because it's happening at the individual level. This is where the internet is critically different than something like radio or television. The experience can be totally individual. So why is this going to translate, as I said, into this data crisis? Well, the population of the world is still growing, 9.6 billion people. It's a lot of people. Does anybody think it'll break 10 billion? We could do like a daily stats, sports betting, population of the future world. Why is it not going to get to 30 billion? Everybody thinks it's going to stop at 9, maybe 10, because as people move into what is considered social democratic market economies, they stop having kids to the point that you have governments that are actively campaigning now to try to encourage their population to have kids. So this, this trend in particular may not go on forever. But right now, there is still a lot of population growth. At least a few more billion people are going to be added to this. They're all going to have smartphones. They're all going to have Fitbits. They're all going to have Nike shoes with all kinds of tracking devices in them. They're all, just go watch any of the footage that's on any of the major news networks of any, of, any part anywhere in the world, and you're going to see somebody wearing a New York Yankees hat. All this market commodity has spilled. It is truly now a global institution. Those people are going to be connected. There are all kinds of technologies right now. Facebook and Google are probably the most public in what they're trying to do to drive this. But bring them in. There's still only 3.5 billion of the people currently on the system. So if they just suddenly got on the system, the capacity would need to double. Plus, you're going to have 2 billion more, which is another 25% increase. So you're going to have significant investment and growth just to keep up with that growing population who is demanding and will connect to the digital world. And at the same time that's happening, the number of devices per person is exploding. And if you haven't been following the Internet of Things jargon, is this a term everybody's heard? You're familiar with this idea, Internet of Things. What does this actually mean? What are those things? <laughs> yeah, you're holding the most important one, a mobile phone. This is pretty convenient that it transmits and sends pretty much all the data that I could right now as a person be creating. I can sync devices, I can sync a Fitbit to it, I can sync my computer to it. What about my toaster? There is a internet enabled toaster that you can buy on Amazon.com right now. There are all kinds of medical devices and home automation devices that are getting connected. Suddenly your smoke detector and your doorbell are digitally connected to you through your mold. This is just the command center. That's what this is right now. But all these other devices per person are suddenly coming available. That's all data. And it's, this is where I get the most excited about this, what the promise of the internet actually still is. Because it is starting to allow us to quantify things that people, even five years ago, if you said, well, I'm going to take somebody's health data from their wearable, and I'm going to put that into my customer profile of them to see if they're going to have a heart attack or not in the next 25 days. People would just laugh at you. And now Fitbit has an API, and you can pull data that might actually help you predict if you know other things about them. Mortality. Suddenly, we can not just measure, but then also analyze any of this stuff that at one point would have just been seen as totally outside the realm of even reasonable discussion when it came to modeling human behavior. And now suddenly we have everything. We can see if you're an impulsive person who skips brushing your teeth at certain intervals because of your toothbrush. And we can put that into your credit score. You're laughing, but that's what's going to happen. Why wouldn't all these data sets that do give you a more complete picture be used? 
Well, the reason is because we might not be able to actually handle all of it. At least right now, I don't think so. The, the companies, not just within your industry, but the companies who are going to use your systems are going to live or die by the use of that digitized insight. It is better than guessing. At a minimum, you can say that. If that's the case, and you can measure it, and you can analyze it, and you can interpret it, then you have a better chance of making a good decision relative to your competitors, and you'll probably be around, and they won't. Did anybody see this quote floating around online and from the outgoing Cisco CEO that 40%, so he's in this giant room of people that are all there because they use Cisco and love Cisco, and he was like, 40% of you aren't going to exist in a meaningful way in the next 10 years. It's a big chunk. He's attributing it to this. If you can't digitize, if you can't then use that information, you are going to be outcompeted. I think that's already happening. Look at Apple. They went from computers to music devices to music mobile devices to a car. Why wouldn't they move to something else if they see the opportunity? So I think that's actually already happening. Um, and that's a lot of these companies are innovating on other existing ideas. And then there's also just the invention. There's just who's going to create the next breakthrough that's going to make sure that this technology gets to 100% of the population. Well, it's going to be the people who are using this data to make risk-calculated, profit-based decisions. Not revenue-based, profit-based. The only thing that will allow you to stay competitive is if you can actually outspend and outproduce your competition, and profit is your single greatest asset in that. If you're using data to track that and monitor that, you have a good chance of making calculated, and you should have no illusions that they're risks, but you have the ability to then make these calculated risks. If you fail, you're doing it faster than you were before. You can bounce back faster than you could before and eventually you will get to the best solution, probably pretty quickly. As far as the amount, when I said that big data and what people are screaming about right now is going to look humorous compared to what's coming, I'd say whatever the expectation is for growth, you probably need to multiply by about 1,000 to end up being accurate. Because right now, the world is on this massive J curve overall. Where again, single individuals or teams of individuals who are no longer at a physical location but all work remotely and use GoToMeeting or Google Hangouts, where they can produce something that outcompetes long established business models because it's more efficient. It can offer something better to the customer either at the same or even at a lower price, and they capture the market. And it's those technologies that we can't, we can't know what they are yet. They are definitely coming, though. Okay. And I've been giving all of this information to you because, like I said, you're the unsung actual heroes of the modern economy. Nobody might treat you like Kanye West or Kim Kardashian, but you certainly deserve it. You provide a fifth of the growth of what's happening in the world year over year right now. And that's the direct, that's the GDP. That doesn't touch the joy. That's not capturing all those actual multiplier effects. It is, outside of the rule of law, one of the most important components of the modern economy. It is the lifeblood, or it is the path, the blood system, vessels and capillaries of this market economy. It's the information that's traveling on it. 
the only path forward for those people who are going to survive this and get through the data apocalypse is to be focused on profit and to be staying through research and data one step ahead of everybody else in the economy. Does anybody have any questions about what I've talked about today? I'm, I'm actually, I would, this is why I stress that there's GDP and there's everything else outside of GDP. There are health measures that aren't looking like we're going to have the same kind of rapid population life extension that we've had for the last hundred years. Where people would be born in a lifetime where they would then double their life expectancy. Is that the appropriate measure versus GDP? Joy is a very difficult thing to measure. That's why economists end up reverting back to dollars. But there are many other ways to look at this to say, I mean, look at, <clears throat> I said that with productivity, people are having greater flexibility in working. There's also this other chunk of the economy where people are working 100 hours a week. And I actually, I did that personally for a while. It's not nice. The, there's a reason that 50% of the workforce is going to be freelancers in the next five years, in by 2020. And that's because they don't want to go through those same old systems where they get, where they sit there for 100 hours, but they're actually only putting in 75 hours of useful time. If they could just work it out with their boss, they could come in for 80 hours, the boss would be five hours better, they'd have 20 hours left over. There are other people in the economy who figured out how to make that actually work, and then there's this other group that is sticking to those old traditional, they're the dinosaurs. That, that is definitely adding joy outside of even GDP growth that is adding joy to people's lives. Does that answer what you were getting at, though? So I think, I think this is one of those social questions that virtual reality or augmented realities can actually solve. Gonna, gonna teach us some insight into. Because here's just my hypothesis, okay? It's not that the person pr prefers to be in their phone, it's that the person prefers to be with the person who's on the other end of the phone than whoever it is that's in the group, right there immediately. And when they can really just fully tune out and move to someplace else that they're not physically and experience it, then they will. And then you've got the worst case scenario where you're sitting at dinner with six people who are, look like they're passed out drunk, but they're probably off somewhere else with Microsoft HoloLens. The 50 trillion gigabytes of data? That's stored data. Mm -hmm.
Okay. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm here saying, please look at how important you are and prepare for what is coming. Because I definitely think that that's a possibility. The optimist in me, the economic optimist in me says, it's not gonna actually happen. And the argument that we're gonna, we have some sort of growth that might even be linear, or, or I'm sorry, we have some type of growth like the technology that's sort of capacity at some sort of linear rate. And then you have this exponential growth in use and consumption by devices. And it's when those things cross that you're gonna have a crisis. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the economist Thomas Malthus or Malthusian philosophy, which is usually associated with the worst kind of pessimism. This is a very old argument about land. That land has this set capacity, which had been known for 5,000 years at that point. Everybody knew what the capacity of land was. It was, it was in the Bible. You just go look it up. Everybody knew. And he was just showing, here's two charts. We're about to run out of food. But as that moment got closer and closer, the profitability of finding a solution goes up, and people will dump resources into it. And people are very, very smart. And if they can be connected, they will find an immediate good solution. And I think we are, I actually think there's already a technology out there that's moving in that direction. Um, so this is. Uh, tied to quantum entanglement, but quantum teleportation. What if you don't have to lay wire anymore? You went from copper to, to light cables because they could be faster. What if you don't have to physically lay anything anymore? What are your profit margins going to be if all the costs of pipelines and work crews and that physical fixed cost that you don't actually even want to give up? This is why I put something in there about the sunk costs. That is so ingrained in people's head. Oh, we've already spent that money. We've got to continue to get use of it. No, that's not how an economist would tell you how to operate, at least. Those are done and, and spent. You're not getting them back. Don't let that stop you from investing in something that's going to move you away from that that's going to have these giant scale effects. So the optimism in me says it's, we're going to get by on the razor margin, but we'll get by. We have time for one more question. Okay, thank you very much for having me. I will put these, I'll give them to whoever so they can be online. It was very nice speaking to you and I hope to be able to talk to you after this.